how not to be fearful about sharing the good word. And I'm looking forward to seeing if there are other methods to use to help people not to be fearful. So what I hope to learn today is how to get over my fear of sharing my faith. What I hope to learn today is how to deal with rejection when I share the word of God. And one of the things I'm looking to learn today is how to properly share my faith. You know, I, there's got to be a right and wrong way, you know? I, I agree. There's much more to Christianity than just coming to church and filling a pew. Amen. You know, so I, I want to know how to present God's word to people. Evangelism needs to be a part of our lifestyle. And for us, it has to be about proclamation evangelism. We're there to proclaim the good news, see people come to know Christ. My friends, all the things that you've been longing for in life, it's found in the person of Jesus. I wanted to preach the gospel. It's because God put a burden in my heart. What's the purpose of the pen? The purpose of the pen is to write, but can only fulfill its purpose when it's in its master's hand. It's never been about us, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. It's what is the Holy Spirit leading us to do? He carried the cross on his shoulders So you could start over God wants to work in your life right now. My friends, he'll change everything. You'll never be disappointed. And so right now, what I'm going to ask you to come and stand right down here in front of me. I'm going to ask you to do it publicly. God is calling you, and you need him in your life right now. I love to preach the gospel and to see what God does and the amazing results that we see around the world, thousands of people coming forward. You're just not affecting one person. You're seeing it for generations being affected. God's called me, and Will Graham's got to be faithfully doing this until God calls me home, and I'll be doing it until then. I have John Cass. On my further left, I have John Brandenburg, and on my right, uh, Don Reber. So I want to start this morning with, uh, with you guys just taking about a minute and sharing why you are involved in being part of Will's team. Who wants to take that first? Why, are, why, is it, why do they look at the boss? They're looking at the boss. Ladies, ladies first. They're looking at the boss first. is what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Don, you want to start us I'll off? I'll dive right in. Yes, I'm okay. Don Reber, and um, raised in Lynchburg, Virginia, and actually am a current resident of Rapid City, South Dakota. That's so right. So I actually moved myself out here um, to be part of this wonderful journey, and um, that's what it is. It's just sharing and caring with people, making connections with all of you, and it's sharing the gospel of Jesus. That's why I like to join the team and be part of the celebration. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. My name is John Brandenburg, and I'm also a celebration director. And I'm originally from Minnesota. And now Minnesota. I live in Minnesota. Now I live in North Carolina. And I get to fly out here every month and just be in beautiful South Dakota with you guys. And I love it. Um, I've been with Billy Graham for a long time. And I just, what I love about evangelism is, you know, somebody who accepts Christ just they can be you know scripture says we are god's workmanship created in christ jesus to do uh good works that he's prepared in advance for us to do and so i love it when you see somebody that come to know christ i mean they're special they're god's workmanship and god can just change them into i mean their best version and i love that uh john cass i am originally from the great state of south dakota uh <laughs> That was weak. He's from South Dakota. That's a little better, yeah. Um, I started uh, 24, 25 years ago with Billy Graham. I'm one of a handful of us that had the opportunity to work on Billy Graham Crusades, the Franklin Graham Festival, and now a Will Graham celebration. Uh, the reason that I continue to do the ministry work that I've done is because Billy Graham so many years ago when he started his ministry would look at the crowd of people that would respond to the gospel presentation. And he would say, and he, he asked these, these words to his team, and it's what's kept me glued in as long as it has, was where are they going to be 5, 10, 15 years down the road? Because the reality is evangelism is not complete 
until the evangelized become evangelistic. Evangelism and discipleship go hand in hand. Yes, they do. And so my heart and passion, because I was also a former college football coach, <clears throat> former Army sergeant. I love Marines, but I'm not a Marine. I'm an Army sergeant. <laughs> Uh, I made the mistake of calling, and I said, hoorah, and he looked at me like, don't um, ever do that again, and I said, all right. <laughs> so there's that element of discipleship has to take place, but you can't do one without the other, and Billy Graham laid that on my heart, so everywhere we go, that is the passion that comes from me when we have the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, what we're going to try and do, we're going to try and be as brief as possible, but still answer these questions the good news is is that uh don john and john <laughs> will be uh will be out in the foyer afterwards and you can continue to ask questions and glean from their uh experience now at calvary chapel those of you that have been coming for uh for any length of time you realize that we have a very very simple mission statement here it's win disciple send kind of hard to read those little tiny those little tiny verses up there but when a person to Christ according to what mark what 1615 and basically go into all the world and what preach the good news to everyone, to everyone. put it up there in the New living translations because it's easy to remember and then we move from when to disciple disciple a person in Christ according to Matthew 28 19 and 20 who's got that anybody Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And keep going. Teaching them to observe what? All things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you even what? To the end of the age. And then when disciple send. Send someone out for Christ. According to Acts 1.8. And you receive... Power. power. I'll teach them to do it like a Baptist. Power, right? Right? And you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my what? Witnesses, Witnesses in Jerusalem, 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 Judea, Samaria, Samaria, and the end of the earth. uttermost parts of the earth. Ends, ends of the earth. And in reality, I think that that would be a great mission statement for every evangelical church to have. That when disciple Sin. That's what we see in the book of Acts, and that's what we need to be seeing a little bit more today. So um, let's do this. It's question time. What, uh, what do you three enjoy most about sharing your faith? For me, it's bragging on God. It's bragging what? on Jesus. Bragging on God. Yeah. yeah. It's his story. Yeah. We're living through it. Okay. All right. You gentlemen? Well, it... I, it's, for me, it's just the conversation that started. There's a story that every person has every single day of our lives. Those of us that are Christians that have been walking with him, we're still evolving. We're still becoming what he has laid out for us when he began us, you know, forming us in our mother's womb. But then what are the stories of those that are far from God, that don't know, that have no hope? Because there are people that are watching you. Everything that you do, they watch what you do. They go through the same things that you go through, but they, have, they don't have this hope. And I'm not talking about, I hope I marry this guy or this girl. I hope I get this job or this house. We're talking about that confident expectation. You and I that are followers of Jesus Christ, we get to see the King. Mm. That's the hope that others are paying attention to. And I love having that opportunity to share. Good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brandenburg? Well, I think, I think that um, there's a verse in Isaiah, uh, what is it, 6, six 9, and it just talks about how we um, basically need to give people an opportunity to accept Christ. You know, we need to let them know, and, uh, you know, people can either accept or reject. And I, when I think about sharing my faith, I think about the loved ones in my life, and there's some of them that I don't know where their faith is. And have I ever brought up that conversation with them? And some of those, those burdens of people that I love, you know, I don't know where they're at. Um, that, just, that just motivates me to share my faith. That's good. You know, what John is talking about is where uh, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up. And then, uh, 
And then he's so consumed by the, by the immensity of God. He says, here I am, send me. And that's, that's the context of what, uh, what John was talking about. And, and the challenge with that is that, uh, that it usually turns out, instead of saying, here I am, send me, it's here I am, send Mark. Or here I am, send Lindsay, send somebody else. But, uh, but we all have that opportunity. Thank you. So let's move on to the next question. Next question is, uh, well, it's clear that we cannot uh, disciple those that haven't been one to the Lord. So on that topic, do you think that most Christians are actively involved in soul winning? I think they want to be. There's a part of us when we become a Christian that we want to share our story, that we want to go and tell other people, but we just get frozen in the fear of the know-how or fear of that rejection on, is my story not good enough? Um, so I think that there's an element of we want to do it, but how do we do it? Yeah, yeah. Would you guys agree? Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Okay. What do you think, John? I think evangelism is kind of like donuts. Yeah, work, yeah. work with me here. <laughs> <laughs> bacon so, and bacon? All right. With bacon. Donuts. So you have a donut shop, and in the donut shop there's a glass case, and then there's these beautiful donuts all lined up. Um, but if the glass case is closed and it doesn't get shared with other people, what happens to the donuts? They get stale. That's right. And we have the bread of life, Jesus, the word of God. And if we don't share it, it's going to go stale. And so just think of donuts next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jesus said something about if salt loses its saltiness, it's what? Useless. Yeah, basically, basically. All right. Um, who is the call? Let's do this one. Who is the call of evangelism to? You want to take that one? Who is the call of evangelism to? It could be a loaded question because some of us will sit here and say, well, we've read in Corinthians, right? That God gives some of us the gift of evangelists, pastors, teachers, ministers, all these different things. But the reality is, if you have a heart for Christ, this is where the coach is going to come out in me in just a minute. If you've said yes to Jesus, there are no bench riders. You don't get to sit on the bench. Because remember what I just said, others are watching you live this thing called life. They go through the exact same things that you're going through. So the reality is, the call is on our lives. It goes back to the challenge of what these guys talked about earlier, is that we can go stale, there's the fear episode that creeps into our lives there's the challenge of i'm just not I, I think one of the biggest challenges we face when we come to a question like that who's a, who is it for and if i say it's it's for all of us there are no bench riders in god's team but Easy. i think one of the biggest challenges sorry i get you, you get me excited you got to hold on a second <laughs> i think one of the biggest challenges that we face is that you've said yes to Jesus, but do you believe that he has actively said your sins are forgiven? Mm. Because if you do not believe you are forgiven, because guess what? I stumble, bumble, and fumble through this thing called life. I've been doing this a long time. Greg's been doing this a long time. But we don't have life figured out. That's foolishness. It's a constant effort. But if we don't understand that when God says, I forgive you, and you don't believe that, that will never make sense to you. This phrase, we will always say, God, send someone else. Amen. Yeah. Yep. All right. I'm sorry. Now. So uh, to bring that into a soundbite, who is the call of evangelism to, you would say? Everyone. Everyone. Okay. Good, 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 good. That's exactly... Uh, what I think the Bible teaches. I Googled, this is funny, I Googled uh, evangelism and Bible verses, mm -hmm. and this was the first article that came up. I thought it was incredible. Billy Graham from, I don't know, that's circa late 50s, early 60s, probably somewhere around there. And if you haven't listened to Billy Graham's early sermons, you need to. You just, you just need to. It's a, it's a good time. But, but uh, can you... Can you share? You know, we, we often talk about those three primary scriptures when, when we're talking about evangelism, Mark 16, 15, and Matthew 28, 19 and 20, and Acts 1, 8. But what are some other scriptures that, uh, that motivate you guys 
to share your faith? For me, it's the charge of Paul whenever he talked about in 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and he was charging, um, excuse me, Paul was charging Timothy, and that kind of, I gleaned from that on being charged myself. Um, I just want to read a few phrases for you if I could. Do the work of an evangelist. Right. Love that. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with the sound doctrine. Instead, to suit up their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say, what is their itching ears want to hear? Will we turn their eyes away from the truth and turn aside to myths? But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardships, do the work of evangelists, dis discharge all the duties of your ministry. Yeah. And that's just a, it's just a charge, just an encourager to me. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Honor Christ. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness, gentleness and respect. First Meekness. Peter 3.15. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You guys taking notes on these? It's a good time to take notes. Anybody? Anybody? Take some notes. Very good. Very good. Very good. John? Yes. I have a verse in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 19 and 20. Yeah. And There's I don't ambassadors. know why God has done this, but he's entrusted to <laughs> us <laughs> as the, the body of Christ. I don't know why he's entrusted it to me, you know, to you guys. Yes, but... I, He's entrusted to us this message, and it goes, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That message. Wouldn't it be so easy for the Lord just to provide every, how many people are on the planet now? 7.8 billion people. On, wouldn't it be so simple for him to provide a burning bush for every one of those people on the planet? But he doesn't do that because he calls us the light of the world. And we are his, the, the, the passage says that we are his ambassadors as though God is making his appeal through us. And I'm going, man, that, you should have chose better, Lord, right? <laughs> when I'm thinking of me, you guys have it all, all down well. But, but that is his desire. He wants imperfect saved people. To share the good news with imperfect, unsaved people. Doesn't have to be any more complicated than, uh, than that. I have a couple other. Uh, this is Matthew. This is the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. Um, Jesus is up on the Sea of Galilee, and he's preaching and teaching uh, the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, healing uh, every sickness and disease, all, all of that kind of stuff. But I, I want to read this for you. This is, uh, well, let's just read it off of here. Then, uh, actually, Don, will you read that? Sure. Can you read that for us, please? Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. All right. Can I get one of you guys to comment on what does it mean that the harvest is plentiful? I, again, to me, it goes back to the simplicity of everywhere you go. If you, will, if you will just pause for a moment, everywhere you go, God will show you someone. Mm -hmm. When you're stopped at a stoplight, there's a story walking by you. There's a story that pulled up beside you. Again, these people are going through the same things that we go through. It's Without all Jesus. Us. Without Jesus. They have, they have this. They are hopeless. And think about the world we're living in right now. How we can be told one thing today, a different thing tomorrow. And the only thing that's keeping everybody together is fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they're running down this way or they're running. Everywhere you go... There's a story that God will allow you to interact. And I found this true, uh -huh. if I can deviate just for a moment. Sure. You're bigger than I am. Deviate all you want. <laughs> <laughs> is whenever I prayed this prayer, God has answered it 100% of the time. Are you guys ready? Because you've got to be serious. Whenever I've prayed this, he has answered it 100% of the time. 
I, time, I've said, God, give me somebody to talk to today. Hey, have you heard that before? Yeah. Yeah. 100% of the time. Now, here's what's happened in a few of those. I've gotten busy, and I walk by it, and I'm like, oh, that was an opportunity. I missed it. If you'll pray that prayer, God will give you that opportunity because it's all around you. That's, that's what John is saying. When you have Jesus' heart for people, you, you see them as lost. It's easy. I mean, usually it's pretty easy to tell people that have the spirit of the living God dwelling inside them and people that are just going through their day doing their best with what they have. I mean, I, I can't, I mean, can you think about living life now without Jesus? I mean, I thought I could do it for 32 years of my life, and nobody ever shared the gospel with me. Not one person loved me enough to share the gospel with me. But the, the minute that I heard it, this is something different. And the third, uh, well, the first invitation to receive Christ. I went to church three weeks in a row with all my partier friends that were out there chasing girls, and that's why we went to church, to meet girls. And, uh, and, uh, and the Lord just captured my heart. And he said, yes, that's what I used to get you here so that you would fall in love with me. And uh, I, I couldn't wait. As soon as I heard the good news and I heard it explained in just a very simple, articulate way, I, I knew I was lost and the simplicity of being found. So, so Yeah, and I mean, the, the, the reality is in high school, I had somebody came up to me every single day, you know, telling me everything I did wrong. What a blessing he was. <laughs> he never shared about God's grace. He never shared the other side of the story. He pointed out everything I was doing wrong as captain of the football team, captain of the wrestling team. Boy, that's the person that, yeah, we need to get him on our team. Well, thank you that I'm on the team. But we have to finish the story. Yeah, that's good. All right, got another verse for you here. This is Gospel of John. Chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. Congregation participation time. You guys read it out loud. Okay, on three. One, two, three. Read it. Jesus, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do not say, therefore, then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. For they are already white for harvest. Okay. Somebody elaborate on that. What does that mean, John? I just, I think this verse is great because, you know, next year, September 2021, we're going to have an evangelistic event. It's going to be great. You know, there's going to be, um, Will Graham will preach. People are going to come forward. You know, there's going to be young people that are going to accept Christ. Gray-haired ladies are going to run forward to the stage. And there's going to be, you know, friends and neighbors are going to come and, uh, you know, get right with God and make a decision for him for the first time. So that's, that's like harvest, right? Um, but the cool thing is, you know, it's what, what is it now, November? So we're, you know, nine months ahead. But there's, in the harvest, there's seasons, right? So there's a, you know, there's the planting and then the watering and then the reaping. And, I mean, you guys get to be involved. You know, you're involved from the beginning here. You get to think about all right, which friend do I want to invite to the event? Which, which neighbor? You know, who needs Jesus? And then I guarantee this, people are going to come to know the Lord even before Will Graham comes to town, you know, and the band mm -hmm. shows up and, uh, you know, everybody gets amped up. It's, it's going to be great. You know, you think about white for harvest, um, you know, right? What season is now? It's, you know, it's November. When we were here on Wednesday, we walked out. And we didn't know it was going to snow, but it had snowed. Oh, we didn't know either. Yeah, we didn't know that. <laughs> but we were here with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were here. And, uh, you know, what is snow? It's, it's delayed water. Delayed, you know, that's like the prayers that are going out now. It's softening the ground of this entire region, Rapid City, the Black Hills. Sorry, I'm going a little 30,000 feet here, if that's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, prayers are going out. It's watering the ground. You know, you guys are going to start praying for your neighbors and friends. And... Uh, you know, the Bible talks about us being like grass, you know. We grow up, it's beautiful, and then we're gone. I mean, our lives are so short. But, uh, you know, this, this snow melt, this water is going to let that grass grow. And there's friends and neighbors that are going to come to know Christ, and you are going to be involved in that harvest, too. And so it's, that's why we're, 
we're starting ahead of time. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's okay to invite your friend to church, you know, or share them about Jesus even before the event. Yeah. It just amazes me. You know, he says, do not say when Jesus says, do not say something. I think we should pay attention to that because very often we think, well, I'll tell my neighbor tomorrow. Or I'll tell my family members, it's hard to have that conversation with family members, isn't it? I'll talk to my mom or my dad about it, you know, uh, tomorrow or next week, or I'll wait for that perfect timing, and, and there is no perfect timing. Jesus says, the fields are ripe for harvest right now. We keep thinking that we can get inside people's minds that, uh, oh, they won't accept Christ today, but maybe next week, or in, all we're doing is what? stalling, right? All we're doing is stalling what we know that God has called us to do. And I've told you many times, delayed obedience is disobedience. So we need to be out there. Don't say four more months. Say today. Today, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to share the good news with somebody. I mean, it's not a bad idea to plead with the Lord every day. Lord, give me at least one person today to share the gospel with. Now it's up to him if he's going to provide that or not. And I know we're going to get to this in a little yeah. bit, but finishing that up, starting today is I, part of the fear that we have is the reaction, right? When we talk about family, mm -hmm. I know I'm getting ahead. Go ahead. But uh, it, it's one of those, you got to take care of business. Uh -huh. You guys are the professionals. I, I get I'm it. I'm just a rookie. I get it. It's the fear of how people are going to respond to me. They're going to mm -hmm. reject me. They're going to... I have really good news for you. You cannot find it in the best-selling book, the most accurate book ever written in the history of man and woman, pushed, pushed down through the ages. You cannot find it that you're responsible for a person to make a decision to follow Christ. Amen. Amen. You are responsible to open your mouth. Mm -hmm. After you've done a great job of listening, hearing their story, open your mouth. They're not rejecting you if you are doing it with the compassion that Jesus Christ shares with you every morning that you wake up. Sorry, I get a little fired up. Every morning, you get mercies new every morning. Mm -hmm. It's a reset. You know it. It's truth. Speak it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Don't wait. Don't wait. I've been there. Gang, and I've done this for a long time. And whenever I have to... I know, we're getting ahead. Whenever I have to start sharing... I start shaking, fumbling pages. Will I remember? Will I say it right? But I get to the point where we've gone too far. This isn't just a conversation about how you're doing. I may never see you tomorrow because none of us in here are guaranteed our next breath. That's good. That's good. All right, Don, how about you? I want you to take this next one here. This is uh, Romans 1.16. Again, let's read it together. What's it say? For I'm not ashamed of the, the gospel, gospel of Christ. Of Christ. For it's the power of God to salvation, to salvation for everyone, everyone who believes, for the Jew Jesus first, and also, and also for the Greek. How does that tie into evangelism? So for me, um, I'm just very simple-minded, and I'm going to wrap it up pretty quick. <laughs> um, but until the Lord returns, there will always be one more. Amen. And he is relying on us to be that, that hands and feet to share the gospel. So I have to look around and say, who is the one that God's wanting me to go and speak to and let him do the work within them. Amen. 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 All right. Let's do one more here. I think uh, this is one of my favorite verses. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. Again, congregation. The fruit, the fruit of, of the righteous, righteous is the tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Okay, can uh, John, you want to take that? Just comment briefly on that verse? Sure. Um, I think, you know, I think of tree, I think of like generational, um, generational fruit. And there might be somebody that comes to know Christ now and their, you know, grandchildren will still be walking with the Lord. You know, your own governor, Governor Nome, I think her, is a grandmother, came to know Christ at a Billy, Billy Graham, Graham crusade. crusade. Yeah. My, my grandfather, a farmer in Iowa, came to know Christ in the 50s when he watched a Billy Graham movie. Hmm. You know, there's, there's a generation thing. You know, somebody might come to know Christ here, and, you know, the fruit just keeps coming. Yeah. He who wins souls is what? Wise. wise. So, if he who wins souls is wise, what is the opposite of that? 
Okay, he who does not win souls is not. And obviously, it's like John said. One plants, one waters, God gives the increase. No man, uh, no one can come to the son unless the father draw him. So we can't. I, I used to sit in uh, coffee shops or wherever I was, and I would try to talk people into accepting Christ. And what I learned through all those futile years, because people would say yes just to get me out of their face, you know. Uh, if, if somebody can talk you into something, if somebody can talk you into something, somebody can talk you out of something. But when it's regeneration and it's the Holy Spirit who has convicted that person of their sin and, and, and spoken... No, I cannot convince anybody of the love of Christ. But once you've experienced it, you know it. Mm -hmm. And when you experience his love for the first time, you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. And so uh, I just share the gospel as often as I can. I leave the results. I leave the results to him. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so I have a couple of articles here from Christianity Today. Uh, look, at, uh, look at those headlines. The first one here says, Why has evangelism declined? And the other one is just from uh, July of last year. But this one is from January of 2020. July of last year. You don't accidentally evangelize. If you don't prioritize, it won't... Uh, it won't happen. So can I get you guys to comment a little bit on those titles, on, the, on those articles? I think we've gotten off track a little bit. You know, sure. What's, we need to get back to the main thing. It's the main thing. That's what I believe. Okay, good. Well, it's a, I like the word prioritize in there. It's a priority of ours. I mean, we have to wake up every morning with a urgency to get in God's word and to have a relationship with him, which enables us to then empower to be evangelists and to walk these streets and to go into your workplaces and to tell others about Jesus or to walk in the neighborhood and share with someone down the street. So it's just a priority yeah. that we just have lost over the years. How many of you uh, have ate some food this week? <laughs> okay, most of us. Okay, some of you. Haven't? Well, get, those, get these people a cheeseburger. Come on. <laughs> Take them out to lunch. You prioritize eating. But Jesus said, my food is to do the will of God. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we're half an hour into this, and we know that the will of God is that we would have a burden for lost, uh, for lost people. What do you think of this? I, I think some of it is, is we've been trained mm -hmm. in certain ways to do certain things, and we get stuck in a way of doing it. And uh, as, as Greg has just mentioned earlier, right, we don't, we don't allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. If it's a divine appointment, have a conversation. You know, the, why is evangelism, the, instead of starting with our questions, because, you know, when I first started off, it was like, my mom was the first one I went after. I had memorized scripture. I was honing. I was, I was blowing and going. I was, I was throwing stuff at her. And finally, she puts up her hand and says, stop. You are intimidating me. And I'm sitting there going, wait a second. I, I, I've studied. Bet you nobody has ever told him that before, huh? <laughs> I've, it's a little I, intense. I, 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 I've, I've studied this. And his tears are rolling down my cheek because I want my mom to come to Christ. But I, some of it is we, we pick up these programs and we think that's how you do it. You, you need to learn. You need to spend time. But I think with uh, the, just that concept there, part of it's declined because they're not going to listen to me anyway is how you start. Mm -hmm. You don't start with, God, give me one. And you don't practice, and then that goes into the prioritizing. Mm -hmm. you got to do it. The more you do it, the more... <laughs> I've, I've done it hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times now. I still shake me when too. I'm at that point. Yeah. Yeah, because I know I'm going to say something wrong. You know what typically happens to me? I know I get I get carried away. 
You know what typically happens to me? Is I start running through my day and start tallying up how many times I failed Christ. Mm. And then it comes down to who am I to tell them? But Mm. Greg already told you, right? It's one broken person that knows the truth talking to another broken person that does not know the truth. I always heard it put this way. It's just one beggar telling another beggar where to find food. Mm. Easy peasy. Don't have to complicate. Don't have to complicate the gospel. So um, just a quick answer from everybody here. What do you think? What do you think? Nobody laugh, okay? What is the percentage of Christians that you would say share their faith regularly? And what I mean by regularly is at least once a week. John, what do you think the percentage of Christians sharing their faith at least once a week? I'm sure it's less than half. (laughs) Well, duh. (laughs) Way less than half, right? Okay, what do you think? Single digits. Single digits, yeah? What do you think? 20%. 20 percent i think that we're single digits probably right i think uh i think we're in the lower portion of single digits sharing the gospel regularly regularly so all right here's another one this is according to uh to barna research in uh in u.s decline of christianity continues at a rapid pace and over on this side it's a barna article from may 15th 2018 sharing faith is increasingly optional to Christians. Why don't you share on that a little bit? I mean, where there's the facts right there that John was just speaking into, that it's a training that we're being shown these articles, but what are we doing about it? We're we're reading the decline. We're reading that it's going away, but the Christians that are in this room today, what are we doing to increase that, to make that grow? That's the conviction. John, what do you think the correlation is between these two articles? I think that, well, it looks like there's less Christians that are modeling what it means to share your faith. You know, I think we have less, less strong Christians out there that are, are showing other people in the church, what does it mean to reach my neighbors? Yeah, I think it was John Cass who said a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, I, uh, until a Christian is actually, until a disciple is actually making other disciples... They are not fulfilling the Great Commission for one, and two, they're not doing what God has called them and purposed them to to do. I mean, if the goal, I've told you this before, if the goal is that we would spend eternity with the creator of the universe forever, why doesn't he just take us home the very moment that we accept Christ? Because he leaves us here to be a salty influence to the world so that more people would be one to Christ. I, I, I don't want to go to heaven alone. I want to take as many people as, uh, as I can, as I can with me. Okay, now let's get to this article here. Um, it's again, according to Barna Research, uh, February 2019, says almost half of practicing millennials say evangelism is wrong. What do you say to the millennial that, uh, or anyone else, it doesn't just have to be the millennial, who claims that it's wrong? To evangelize. You ever heard anybody say that? You've never heard people say that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I have. I have. I have. Okay. So what would you say? I love having this conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Part of, here's part of the challenge. When you read this stuff, right, it becomes discouraging. Well, there's no hope. This isn't what you're supposed to be reading, first and foremost. The best-selling book of all times, the most accurate book ever written in the history of man and woman, passed down through the ages, is your guidepost. It's your reset mark. So when we get into the conversation, and I love young people because they're smarter than me. I just love having the conversation. But when you get into some of this, it's secular and you can't get out of it. Because I'll stop them and say, okay, well, let's talk about the world we live in. Is social justice important? Well, yeah, it's important to feed people. It's important to, you know, racism shouldn't exist. And we go over this list and list. So where does it end? Because it's been there since man has been walking earth. Where does it end? How does your point help that situation go on? Aren't you, in fact, 
if I'm supposed to listen to you on your position on social justice issues, are you not evangelizing me to take your point? Don't give me this stuff and say that's truth for you because now you're starting to get into a fun world of apologetics. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, they know. Now, they know. Yeah. now you're starting to say your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. That and means there is, is no, no truth. absolute truth. Yeah. You have a problem, and that's where I say it becomes secular. You can't get out of the conversation. God has not changed his word. Address that with me. I'll listen to your story. I'll listen to what you're telling me and why it's important. But you have to. You have to. If you say, gang, here's where, here's where my military army sergeant comes out. Not Marine. Army. If, if you say, I, even using the word Christian is so loosely thrown out there anymore. Let's, let's just nail it to what it is. If you say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, I can tag you, as Galatians 6.1 says, right? We see a brother and sister who is sinning, yeah, that we are to go to them, help pull them up out of that sin. Be careful we do not fall. We can hold one another accountable. If you say to me, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, then this is your guidepost. This is your reset mark every single morning. Then what do you do with Mark 16, 15? What do you do with Matthew 28, 19, and 20? What do you do with Acts 1, 8? So it doesn't, doesn't matter any generation. The problem is, is that, that, that the church has not done a good job at discipling the generation that is coming up below them. Remember, we went through this just on uh, Wednesday night in uh, Judges 2.10 that uh, another generation arose who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. And, um, and just remember, the stuff that you read like this, they are statistically skewing questions, even if they love Jesus. This is your starting point and your ending point. Amen. At the back of the book, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Perfect. All right. Here's a few more uh, statistics from, from Lifeway. 61% of uh, Christians have not shared how to become a Christian with anyone in the past six months. I think that number is, is way higher, way higher than that. 48% have not invited anyone to church in the past six months. That's, a, that's the easiest thing that you can do. That's the, that's the simplest, no-brainer no excuses. We have invite cards. All you have to do, invite somebody to church. Just throw an invite card at them and run. I mean, if that's the best you can do, if you can't, if you're afraid to share the gospel with them, you know, well, just don't hit them in the eye. They'll sue you. But uh, here's some more. 20% rarely uh, or never pray for people who are not professing Christians. You know, whenever I'm riding my bike and I'm riding from my house, you guys know where I live, um, from my house until I hit Anamosa and then I go and hit the trails that way. All those houses, when I'm going those back streets, I am praying for the people in those houses. I have no idea what's going on. I'm just praying, Lord, open their hearts. It's an easy thing to do. You know, we, sh we should be doing it. We have adopted uh, East St. Patrick Street and, and as to be praying for the people in that area. So when you're coming down, just be praying. Couples be praying out loud for the people to say in that blue house and that, you know, especially we just had Halloween. Guess whose houses I was praying for more, you know, all those interesting houses that, uh, that were decorated so, uh, so well. 75% feel comfortable sharing their belief in Christ with someone. I think that that is way too high. Um, and 8% are hesitant to let others know, uh, they are even a, uh, a Christian. Here's, um, Here's the question. Why doesn't the average Christian share their faith? Now, we have jumped ahead. We've talked about this a little bit. But just what are some, uh, what are some reasons that people don't share their faith? Well, it's that fear. Probably number one, it's right? Probably number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that, it, that, you know, our story isn't good enough. For me, I was raised in a Christian home. So I had Christianity all around me all the time. We went to Sunday morning, we went to Sunday night, we went to Wednesday night. And that was just drilled and trained in me. So I knew no different. But it's, it's understanding people were always raised like that. So it's that fear of my story is not going to be good for someone that may need a better story. 
So that's what timi- intimidates me. Mm-hmm. But we don't need to live in fear. No, no, not at all. I mean, I would just echo, you know, it's that social awkwardness, I think, mm-hmm. you know, and maybe it's more in your mind. It plays around, it bounces around in there. But I think of this verse, it said, many of the, this is from John 12, many of the leaders believed in Jesus, but it says, but they would not confess their faith for fear. Mm. Mm. You know, and there, it was, the fear was this social rejection. Mm. And, uh, and the scripture is a little, it's pretty hard. It says, um, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Ouch. That's scary, Ouch. isn't it? I mean, yeah. That's, that that's hurts, who we are that sometimes. Hurts me, I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. We, a lot of times he's talking about religious leaders, right? Mm-hmm. So those that went to church all their lives, those that were part of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this question, and it's along the same, along the same line, you know, why do Christians fear sharing their faith? What do you guys think? Rejection. 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 Okay. What else? Not, not knowing the Bible enough. Not knowing the Bible enough. What to say? Okay. What else? Lose your job. Okay. Let me comment on that. Mm-hmm. Raise your hand if you know of anyone who has ever lost their job for sharing the gospel. Okay? I think I saw maybe one over here. Okay? One. So bag that excuse. Bag that excuse. Be wise. Take, take your coworker to lunch. Don't interrupt him, you know, when he's on the phone, you know, trying to make a sale. And say, well, speaking of sales, let me tell you about Jesus, you know? Okay? So erase that from your minds because there, there's no evidence that that is true. Okay? Um, I know that you guys want to comment here, but I want to talk about this uh, article here. It says that we asked 1,600 Christians why they don't share their faith and what prevents people from sharing their faith. And these are exactly, you guys were on the on the right track. These are what their, uh, their list was. Number one, obviously, fear. Fear. You know, public speaking in any situation is, I mean, most people fear death more than, <laughs> more than speaking publicly. But fear, they feel unequipped. They don't want uh, rejection, right? Some people get hostile. You ever gotten somebody get up in your grill because you're trying to tell them about the love of Jesus and go, well, here, number one, here, have a Tic Tac. And number two, <laughs> number two, um, you are a perfect candidate for knowing the love of, uh, nobody's the, ever got hostile with this. the love of, nobody's ever got hostile <laughs> with you. No, I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know I, why. I haven't figured that out. Ask your mom. <laughs> 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 you know, people get hostile. They're too busy. That's an excuse that's got to get bagged too. Too shy. Insufficient relationship. Well, I don't know this person well enough. You know, share with perfect strangers. Jesus did all the time. It's great if you have a built-in relationship with somebody, but don't use it as an excuse not to. It's hard to bring up. Don't want to, uh, to be offensive or... Uh, or uh, to be pushy. Now, now you brought up uh, earlier th- that sometimes you, do you, I mean, you guys, mm. you guys have a heart for evangelism. Do you ever get fearful in sharing your faith? Of course. Of course. It's mm-hmm. Of course. Of course. I've told you many times that I love to share the gospel, but I still get fearful probably every time I share the faith. So don't let that intimidate you. You know, we haven't been given a spirit of what? Timidity. But of power and a sound mind. We, uh, we have the ability to be able to do that. So here's the question that I want to ask you. How do we overcome fear with faith? Who'd like that one? How do we overcome fear with faith? Well, I just, I just reminds me of the verse uh, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Mm -hmm. And so I I think if I just have a verse handy, then it's not my words because I don't know what to say. I don't know how to transition it. I'm not the salesperson type person, you know, that can clinch the deal. If I have the word of God, if I have a verse ready, I can just, I can use that. And I know when uh, Billy Graham started to preach, you guys saw that old picture up there with the, you know, crusade. He... He just took a bunch of verses and strung them together. 
because hmm. he's like, if, if I don't know how to, to speak, you know, very well, I'm just going to use the word of God. And that's what he did. And I feel like that's what we can do as well to overcome fear. I got a great exercise for you to overcome fear. Would you guys like to work on this exercise with me? Drop and give me 20. <laughs> turn, that's his exercise. Turn to your neighbor on your left and say, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Turn to your neighbor on your right and say, no way. No way, Jose. <laughs> You've just been rejected twice. How are you doing? <laughs> You're sitting there saying, well, it can't possibly be that simple. Yet, Jesus gives you an example of where he has been rejected, despised. Aren't you keeping good company? Part of the reason your rejection is making sure that when you're ready, you're ready. So John's point, I have verses. Me, when I went to my mom, my example was I was just up in her grill. I'm just right there. And she's like, back up, man. I'm tasting your yeah, teeth and you're yeah. freaking me out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Have a tic-tac. And then some of it is, like you said, just it goes back to we just got to know what to say. The opportunities are there. Mm. You can be serious, but the reality is they're not rejecting you. If you are doing it because you love your family members, the people that you work, if you have a passion for people, if you're seeing them the way God does, hear them the way God does, if you're feeling for them the way God does. And I'm here to tell you, they don't always act like you, look like you, walk like you, talk like you, or smell like you. Sometimes they're exactly like you. But if your heart motivation is like God's, and you're doing it with the right intent, and they say no way to you, they're not rejecting you. They rejected Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. The pressure is gone. Amen. So on that topic in our last couple of minutes here, give us some examples of how you start a conversation with someone with the intent of sharing the good news. That's always, isn't that a difficult one for all of us? How do you start that conversation? It, Who wants that it's one? It's tricky. I mean, it, really it can is be a yeah. tricky conversation to start because you don't necessarily always know the person, or you don't know the person. You don't want the, you don't want to feel rejected by their love. Um, so it's just it's using that opportunity that that God's given and being aware of it. Instant awareness, I think, where you know you the spirit is within you, and so you hear that voice in your head saying, "This is that moment." And it's, it's seizing that moment. It's seizing that moment to share. It's seizing that moment for the opportunity that Christ has given you. Because I can tell you from experience, when you don't seize the moment and you walk away from it, mm. you feel so much more guilt, and I should have done this. And you may not ever get that opportunity to do it again. So be ready and be purposeful in yeah. seizing that. Um, I can think of one example where I was on a bus as a chaperone with, um, for one of my daughters to go to the zoo. And the lady sitting next to me was also a chaperone. She was from India. And we, we, had, we had shared beliefs. And one of the shared beliefs were she was very, like, moral, you know. And so we were talking about our kids. And that led into spiritual things. So we had something sh that we shared in common. And from there, we kind of jumped. And this was interesting. So we, we had gone through the zoo, and she said, I look into the cages and I see the tigers and I think if that's one of my ancestors and I almost fell out of my seat <laughs> like, you know she really believed that mm -hmm. and then I was able to say well in Christianity we believe that you die once and then it's the judgment and and then I told her I said you know a lot of people believe that you know you you uh, have these good works and at the end um, that, you know, God lets you into heaven if it's good. And she's like nodding her head, and I, and I say, but that's not what the Bible actually says. She's like, what? You know, the Bible says, you know, in your sin, Jesus accepts you mm -hmm. just the way you are, and you just have to believe. It doesn't matter what you've done. And she had never heard that gospel presentation. She had just heard what, you know, culture is throwing out there. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the conversation, she, she didn't accept Christ, but... You know, she said, we went deep. We went, we went really deep. <laughs> so, you know, I think seeds were sown. Yeah, sure. In that case. You know. Yeah. Here's one for you. Um, 
How has evangelism changed in the time of COVID-19? That's a tough one. Who wants that one? I like to, I'm a positive person. Yeah. I like to look at things positively. And <clears throat> for me, COVID, even just to say the word, is like saying the word of cancer. It just immediately becomes negative. Um, but for me, I have found more of a dependency on God, and a, a reliance on him. And I've seen more churches and more people have that same dependency of God's in, God's in control. He's in charge. I've seen it on Facebook postings. I've seen it in Instagram postings. I mean, we all are saying it because we know in our heart that we believe it. But it's our time to act on that. So from a practical perspective, because uh, there's a lot of people um, that you want to come have come to Christ and they're wearing masks and you know, it, it's not easy, it's not simple to have a conversation, especially when, when, when God has given us our faces with all the expressions that we can make, that when we're looking at this and trying to be able to convey the goodness, you know, of Christ, um, I think we should just, we just keep sharing the gospel, you know, it's, 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 it's never been about a mask or it's never been about our ability to be able to string uh, together a great apologetics uh, response to their questions. It's all been by the power of the Holy Ghost. And, and we just, you know, it's, it's harder for me because um, people, are not, people are not as apt to talk to a stranger now due to the fear and the devil is really exploited you know this uh, uh this virus that 99.96 percent of people recover from um but reality perceived or real is what we have to deal with but we're it, it doesn't limit the command to us to continue to share the gospel so it might be a little more awkward it's a little more awkward but it's not going to stop me from, from intentionally doing my best to start a conversation mm. with that person because I know what their outcome is. That's right. Lost people don't go to heaven. People who don't put their faith in Jesus don't go to heaven. That bothers me because of everybody in this room. I am the least. You guys know my background. I, I deserve the least his grace and his mercy to write my name in his book. So if I'm thinking that way, then I want to see everybody, even my enemies, uh, if I ever had one, um, <laughs> would, uh, I, would uh, I'd want to see them one to Christ. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, well, John, I want, you to take, I want you to take this next question. Explain the difference between the spiritual gift of evangelist and the call to evangelism. Well, I think one's a charge uh, that was given as people look at gifting, right? They, they, they will literally walk up to anybody and start a conversation. I know that's not my gifting. I know if you start the conversation, we will go all the way. So I wouldn't say I have that gift of an evangelist, but you, the people that have that gifting, and Greg probably has more of that element as he shared his story, that they're just going to walk up and they will make sure they start that conversation. But the call, as we talked about earlier, is we're all in the game together. It's you. Your life has been touched by the Savior. If it's been touched, you're in the game. If you say, I'm a follower of Christ, you're in the game. That changes the conversation. That, that's probably the simplest way for me. To, there's a charge. We've given this. You know the gifting's there. The knowing of that gifting is some people can memorize Scripture very well, and they can pull that up and use that very, very well. That has a gifting of the evangelist because they're able to take God's Word and make it simple for people to understand it. Yeah. Where a lot of us, we're part two. But yeah. that doesn't mean you don't get to participate. Yeah. Spiritual gift not given to everyone. Spiritual call is given to everyone. Very good. All right. Discipleship. I want to get here real quick. Let's talk this. Well, looking at the time, we're going to make this the lightning round. All right. Okay. We'll make this the lightning round. 
Um, how would you, let's see, yeah, there we go. How, how, uh, how would you define Christian discipleship? If you're following <laughs> Jesus, you know, he says, come follow me, I'll make you disciples of men. Mm -hmm. And he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. I think. Pretty simple, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Practically, it's a little more difficult. Two but words, follow me. Yeah. <laughs> how about this? This is a, uh, this is a definition that, uh, that I found. Uh, a disciple is so disciplined in his or her relationship with God. Mm -hmm. I, for involved in a gathering of believers, Hebrews 10, 25, it says, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren. Okay. It's a command, by the way. Uh, as spirit-filled and spirit-led, concern for others rather than self, involved in serving his uh, or her area of giftedness. Are you using your spiritual gifts? Mm -hmm. I was talking to Ellen earlier, and she just told me, or Ellen, no, Lindsay. Lindsay showed me a list of some of the gals uh, who were at the retreat yesterday who uh, are not serving on a regular basis and realize that, that Jesus came to serve and not to be served, and you're going to start serving so good for good for you but the, but that call is to everyone if you call yourself a christian you should be serving in some capacity okay uh prayerful in all things you know what one of my least loved phrases is well god told me well he did huh did he did he did he give you any scripture to be able to support it so that you know that it's God's voice and not yours. You know, so, so make sure before you tell somebody that God told you to do something that you've gotten wise counsel and that you've got scripture to support, especially in the bigger, bigger decisions. Look, leading others to become disciples. Is that your heart? Is that your heart? Enjoying God always. You know, the joy of the Lord is our strength you can see it and believe it i see it in in people who are going through radical trials and they're not giving up their joy there's a difference between joy and happiness so so uh joy what do you think do you think that's relatively accurate would you guys agree with that okay you'd probably add some things or maybe subtract some things but i think that uh, i think it's a good working definition did uh did jesus uh ever give a definition for being his disciple anybody Don was ready for this. Don? Was, follow me. Yeah. He said, follow me. He said in all four Gospels, two simple words, follow me. I think sometimes we have just the hardest time in just obeying that command. And following follow me. And, you know? and remember, right, he spent three years with his mm -hmm. disciples. Three years, and they're the ones that turn the world upside down through the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Yeah. And before yeah. he think left, he said, go and make disciples. And we still are. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's still the charge. This is what Jesus gave as, uh, as his definition, right? Then Jesus said to those uh, Jews who believed in him, if you, what, abide in my word, you are my yes. disciples indeed. Um, like you said earlier, uh, the word Christian, just a way overused mm -hmm. word these days. And we try to, oh, I'm a follower of Christ or I'm a Christ follower or whatever, you know however you tag that, but Jesus' definition is, if you're not following my word, mm -hmm. you're not a follower, mm -hmm. period. It's really easy to tell who the Christians are for the most part. I'm glad that I don't have to make that call, right. but for the most part, you can tell who's actually a believer or not. And then, and then Luke uh, 14, 33, that will always rock our world. This, remember, these are red letters, right? Mm -hmm. So likewise, whoever of you who, who does not forsake what? All. All cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. Again, it's easy to tell. So that's why we will encourage you, forsake all. If God wants to remove something from your life, he's going to replace it with, uh, with something so much better. On that topic, how do we motivate others to the importance of making evangelism and discipleship part of our life? How do we motivate others to do that? It's a discipline within ourselves first. Mm -hmm. And then it's showing that expression so that it can become a contagious. Yeah. You know, uh, I read this a few, a while ago. I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to, I could quote it. <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> um, evangelistic churches see more persons become Christians through the passionate efforts 
of highly evangelistic Christians. Mm. So it's the contagious of if we're out there expressing and showing the joy of the Lord and making it a discipline in our lives, more people will want that experience or want what you have, and that's your opportunity to share. Yeah. Pastor Mike McIntosh used to remind us all the time that more is caught than taught. You know, you didn't see Jesus sit down and say, boys, today I'm going to teach you about prayer. Boys, today I'm going to teach you about evangelism. Boys, today I'm going to teach you about extending grace. They just followed him. Mm -hmm. Find somebody, follow them who represents Christ well, not perfectly because none of us do. Mm -hmm. Do what they do. Do what they do because sometimes you look at Jesus, well, I could never, well, well, find somebody. Find somebody and uh, follow them. So uh, as many, I, I looked on the sign-up sheet on, uh, on the back table, and many of you have already signed up for the evangelism and, uh, and uh, follow-up seminar that's this Wednesday. I'm going to encourage all of you, <laughs> now that some of you don't think that you can, all you have to do is ask your boss for a couple hours off. That's what I'm encouraging you to do. Uh, there are the evening ones in different locations. And there are evening ones. Yeah, there are, there are evening ones as well. We're hosting one here this Wednesday. But if you go on the Will Graham Celebration site, you'll see eight other opportunities if you can't make it. So don't, don't miss this, uh, this opportunity uh, to be able to glean from a speaker from the Billy uh, Graham Association. Um, so come here. And uh, then, the big, well, a few months in to the year, we are going to have the uh, Christian Life and Witness courses. There will be three of those if you want to be involved in the decision follow-up uh, team. And none of you have to raise your hands on that because I've already signed you all up. <laughs> all right, so please, please plan this week on attending one of those, uh, one of those trainings. And normally we'd have a final song, but I'm just going to wrap things up in prayer if you don't mind. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, thank you for just an incredible opportunity to see what you say in your word about this privilege that you've given us uh, of evangelism and to be your ambassadors and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to share the good news, news that can change uh, a person's soul from hell to heaven. God, it just boggles my mind that you would use any of us, but that is your will and that is your choice. And uh, we uh, volitionally say, here I am, send me. God, for these precious men and women that are in the sanctuary today and those who are listening uh, to our radio station and uh, who will watch this online, God, we ask that you would uh, move us to have compassion for the lost, just like you did, Jesus. You looked out over Jerusalem and you had compassion as because he saw them as, as sheep without a shepherd. There are billions of peoples that have no understanding of the good shepherd. Help us to allow faith to choke out fear and to invite people to see Jesus the way that you've allowed us to see you, God. Uh, today... Jesus, uh, we ask that you would give us somebody to share the gospel with. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, what I learned today was that I'm not the only one that suffers the fear and anxiety and everything else when I'm trying to uh, talk about being, uh, my faith in the Lord. Well, and, and along those lines, we got rejected twice today when John had us turn to the right and to the left yeah, and, and make those comments to the other people. So. It is really pretty simple. But what got me was the discipleship slide that Pastor Greg put up and, and walked down through discipleship and what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. That's something we can all take to heart and something we can all learn from. I am so excited because one of the methods that I learned today was um, not to be too forceful and when you're evangelizing because that can turn someone away but the method that i learned i'm going to be using it with my own family members who have been rejecting the word so yes I, I can't wait to use it and that's going to be today and i learned how not to be fearful and i want to go win the whole world you want to Amen. come with me yes. uh, what i learned today was uh, when someone re rejects um, when I talk about the Word of God, they're not rejecting me, but they're rejecting Christ. What I learned today was that 
it's okay. Everybody's nervous sharing their faith. You know, my, even my pastor's nervous. And, uh, if they don't get the word out, if I don't share it, they might not ever hear it again.